Hey class, I just wanted to start off by letting you know that there was an error in the tech file that I uploaded. Um, it uh, used a, um, a utility called K Border Matrix, which wasn't available on uh, Overleaf. So I've uploaded, I, I've updated and uh, uploaded the change uh, to use a tool or a feature called Border Matrix, which has the exact same parameters uh, for input. So um, it, it was a simplification of the file. It works fine on Overleaf now. I apologize for not testing that. Um, feel free to uh, to dock me in the mid-semester review, uh, which uh, I will be um, uploading uh, something on e-learning about that, uh, so that you can uh, give me anonymous feedback if you would like. Uh, okay, uh, so. Uh, getting back in the spirit of uh, programming, I've uh, been you know toying around with different uh, things that we could look at, uh, and so I, I really would like to give you the chance to look at a project to see uh, how uh, a project might be like a, a web project or something might be uh, structured in, in a professional environment, uh, and so uh, it tends to break down into um, into uh, three top-level directories. There's the uh, persistence directory where you define uh, the structure of your uh, of your persistence layer, so your database. Uh, although there are uh, more than just relational databases these days, there's uh, NoSQL databases, which are um, we'll come back to that. <laughs> and there's uh, the uh, the web API, uh, which uh, now in in modern applications uh, is distinct from the third layer, which is the the presentation layer, the uh, UI, uh, or the web project, uh, or more commonly uh, recently the single page application, uh, and uh, the the responsive uh, UIs that are being developed today are. Uh, very heavily dependent on JavaScript. And so I, I do want to give you a taste in that. Uh, I, I'd spent a, a fair amount of the summer uh, actually um, going over and over this project that uh, I could share with you. And uh, it, you know, I, I was getting uh, uh, fast enough at it that I could do it in just a, a handful of hours. So I could probably spread it out over three or four classes. Uh, but I realized that it's still, um, it misses the point, uh, so it's it's a, a little too intense for um, really something that that I think you could uh, you know take and run with, uh, and so it, it's more um, I guess it, it's overfeeding you. What I, I really need to focus on whenever I uh, I come up with what this project is going to be uh, is something that is a little more open ended uh, and uh, gives you more of a, a first step towards what you need for these projects than. Uh, something that looks uh, you know, more polished or, or more completed. So uh, I'll try and come up with something uh, that is a little easier to digest. Uh, and I, I do want to give you a, a sampling. So in the way that we've, uh, you know, we've uh, kind of jumped around in the uh, code references that we've had between C and uh, Java and uh, JavaScript. And uh, today we'll do C Sharp as well. Um, I, I want to give you those flavors uh, or, or some various flavors uh, for UI development. Uh, and so I, I tend to use React a fair bit because the way that it's uh, uh, developed uh, and, and maintained, uh, it has this kind of natural feel for, for me uh, to um, uh, the HTML structure as well. And, and you'll see whenever we get into that. Uh, and I also really wanted to introduce you to Angular uh, because uh, it is uh, it is very much uh, designed by academic developers. Uh, and, and you'll see, uh, I'll be able to talk fairly extensively about design patterns whenever we discuss it because uh, they're on display uh, right from the outset whenever you uh, create a, a new Angular project. Uh, and then uh, the, the third very popular framework uh, that's out there, and, and there's more. So there's, you're not limited to these JavaScript frameworks. Uh, is Vue.js, uh, and I don't have a, an example project for that at the moment, but and you know, we'll get to that. 
so uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, recovering a bit and uh, trying to uh, figure out what it is that we can work on um, that uh, would still uh, you know, fit my theme of, of uh, code intensive middle third, um, but that isn't uh, a little too much to digest. And so uh, at the beginning, um, uh, whenever we went through our, our overview of just uh, you know, software development and computer science in general, uh, we discussed a, a little bit of data structures and I thought, okay, well, you know, this, this has a nice parallel where we can kind of wrap back around and uh, do some of the, uh, the actual development of these data structures that we just completely glossed over earlier. And, uh, you know, if, if you are taking a data structures class or, you know, you haven't taken it yet, I, I you know, please forgive me. I, I don't intend to step on anyone's toes. It's not my intent. Uh, but uh, I do understand that it, it takes more than one go around uh, in order to kind of ingrain these. So hopefully uh, you'll view this as a, um, as a net gain instead of uh, some, you know, repetitive task. Okay. Uh, so I, I do want to jump between languages as we do this. I, I'd like to go over the heap, the concept of a heap, you know, what you should think about whenever you're representing it or, you know, it, in your head as you're going through it. Uh, and then, you know, what that looks like whenever we uh, finally code it out. Uh, AVL trees, which are uh, a type of binary search trees. Uh, I, I know that red and black trees are as well, but uh, AVL is what I've um, worked on recently, so we'll do that. Uh, and uh, a graph representation in Java. And so that'll be our, our simplest one. Um, but uh, you will get to see me uh, stumble my way through uh, implementing this stuff. You'll get to see that uh, even you know, uh, someone that you would consider to be an experienced developer um, is still going to make mistakes. Uh, so that's the, the benefit of watching me do this you know, with, without rehearsal and uh, you know, without a, a solution already set aside. Um, you'll get to see. Look, it's uh, you know even uh, e even once they have a, a good number of hours under their belt, um, there's uh, still a process and it's still very much work to uh, to get it to work. Uh, there's uh, no other way of saying that. Uh, okay, so uh, but before we jump into that, I, I do want to do the the brain refresher, uh, and so I, I want to uh, discuss recurrence relations, right? So. Uh, let's consider uh, let's consider a recurrence where um, where our quantity uh, our value is cut in half at each step right so So we're given some constant x uh, to start, and that's our, our initial value, right, a0. Uh, and then at our a1 term, is 1 half of a0. Our a2 term. Is 1 half of a1 which uh, which is itself one half and then we do the algebraic substitution where a uh, a1 is equal to one half a0 right so this is, uh, is a quarter of uh, a0 uh, and so if we play this out, you can kind of already see, right? So the one here and the two here, right? So if we play this out, then we get that our nth term Our nth term is uh, half of our n minus one term, or uh, one over two to the n uh, of a zero. Okay, uh, so it follows this uh, this geometric progression, right? In terms of uh, 
cutting in half each time the, the previous step. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the themes in math is that whenever you find a, a series like this, um, so it, something that doesn't <laughs> appear to be defined for every number, uh, is to expand it from uh, from the natural numbers, right? So from the sequence of one, two, and so forth, these, these counting numbers, uh, to uh, to all of the real numbers, right? So to uh, to find that closed form value, uh, so uh, not just a, a formula that you can plug in, right? Which is kind of what we have here, uh, to um, something that's uh, a little uh, more familiar, um, and so um, so here we have these integers, right? Uh, and uh, this is essentially that, that closed form value. We could change n to t, and we would have a, a function of t. Um, but uh, if we play with it a little more, then then we can get something that's um, that's even broader reaching. Uh, and so let's let's do that. Just follow me along the, the series of jumps. Right? So we already have this closed form, you know, this exponential uh, representation or whatever. But let's play with it a little bit. So. Okay, so we have this representation where a over n is 1 over 2 to the n times some initial value, right? Um, and so we have it to where if we just substitute it, right? Uh, then we have that it's 1 over 2 to the t times some constant, right, which is, you know, familiar enough. Um, and so uh, we have at, at regular intervals where at t equals 1, then we have half the value of uh, whatever our initial constant was. t equals 2, we have some other half. And so, uh, but uh, t, you know, is not necessarily designated anything, right? So uh, if it was in uh, one of the programming languages and, and it was uh, given by some timer or uh, you know some internal clock then we could expect t to represent milliseconds um, and in that case we would want you know if, if we really wanted seconds then we would do something like t over a thousand right um, or you know, if, if we were given something that's more precise, then it would be like uh, nanoseconds. So uh, it would be one over ten one over ten to the nine instead. But uh, let's say that we just want to be uh, a little more flexible, and so we um, we'll say, okay, well, let's just make it ambiguous. We'll we'll figure it out later, right? So whatever it is, whatever interval we want to count as one, uh, we'll just label it as t, right? So that'll be our period where we can say that we have incremented our value in over here to satisfy this sequence. Uh, okay, so if you're uh, if you're a very adamant mathematician. Uh, then you'll be looking at this and saying, wait a second, there is only one exponential function. And you're, uh, you know, this thing that you're doing where you don't have e as the base for your exponential uh, is, uh, it's a lie. <laughs> you need to fix this right away. Uh, okay, all right, chill. We'll, we'll do that. Let's do that, okay? So, uh, Right. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, to make the exponent of 2, negative 1. Uh, and then you can simplify this, uh, right? So whenever you have this case where you have something to a power, and then all of that's raised to another power, 
then you can use multiplication within the exponent, right? So that's uh, the way that exponents interact. Um, Uh, okay, so now we have 2 to the minus t over little t over the t representing our period times some constant, right? uh, and then our, our last step. Uh, and for this, we're going to rely on a change of base, right? So. Uh, okay, so whenever you have a to the b, then uh, e and the natural log are inverse operations, right? And, and it's the same thing with any base, right? So the natural log is just log base e. Uh, but if you were doing 2, then 2 to the log base 2 is an inverse operation. Uh, so, uh, so log is the answer to the question like, okay, uh, given this base number, what do I have to raise you know, that base number to in the exponent to get whatever the input to the log is, right? So you're saying, what do I have to raise e to so that e to that power is equal to whatever's in there? Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a circular question. So you don't even need that, right? Like you could get rid of it. But in the case that you're actually trying to change the base, uh, then um, then this is it's an identity operation. It's it's a, a clever way of it's not exactly multiplying by one, but it's manipulating the equation so that it's you haven't actually changed anything. Right? So it's it's an equivalent statement. Uh, okay. And then uh, with logs, when you have something that's inside the uh, the uh, the log function and it's raised to a power. As in this case, we have a to the b inside. Uh, then you can bring it in front, and it's now b times that log and whatever the base value was in there. Right, so log of a. Right, so in this case, a is 2, and b is negative t, little t over big t. Uh, okay, and so now, you know, for those uh, adamant individuals that really insist that there is only the one exponential function and everything else is a, a change of base. Um, okay, now I, I hope that you're finally satisfied, right? Um, and uh, we have this. We have this function in terms of t uh, and some initial value, right? And if you want, you know, we could consider this as a family of functions where t, you know, is some distinguishing term uh, between the families. Uh, it, um, you yeah, this is, whenever you see these subscripts or whatever, it's just a, another way of noting that, uh, you know, they're, it, it's, <laughs> you're dealing with a constant somewhere in that equation, and it doesn't really change the way that we would expect t to, right? Where t is this timing, it's, it's a time variable, and it, constantly updates as time goes on and so you expect you know some sort of you know dynamic thing uh, and this you know clearly it's the same as this is some variable a constant of variation or whatever this is as well right so um, so you know sometimes you'll see people stick a little subscript in there or whatever and it's just a way of saying that you have a thing and if you want it to be used to compute you know, values to actually spit out values, uh, then you have to start filling in these variables, these subscript variables, and that will generate a function that you can then use to actually compute other values, whatever. Um, so what we did, you know, with that sequence or whatever, uh, is we developed the uh, decay function um, for uh, used to compute, you know, half-lives, uh, and so the 
uh, the value here, or uh, I guess here, this ratio or whatever, uh, is uh, you know uh, the decay term, right? So uh, this is the answer to the question, or in this case, t, the period t here, uh, is the answer to the question: How long do I have to wait for half of this radioactive material to decay? Um, and so it's uh, you know is that sequence you know it if you ask the question right so we have a sequence right if you remember how we started so we have a sequence and we have some initial value and we want to cut it in half every time we tick forward our value in so when we go from one to two we want half of the previous value from two to three half of the previous value uh, and so you're able to generate you know this this equation. Uh, you know, pretty readily from that, uh, you know, simple requirement, right? So, uh, so recursive, <laughs> that is one way to, to use recursive uh, definitions. Um, and then uh, I also like the, that it's uh, the geometric series as well, um, because the, the geometric series, uh, and if you're not familiar, that is, uh, Uh, okay, uh, so the, the geometric series is this, where you start with a, a half, and then you add uh, a quarter, and then you add an eighth, or whatever, and so it, it follows this, where it's 1 over 2 to the 1, plus 1 over 2 to the 2, plus 1 over 2 to the 3, and so forth, and you get this series, and it approaches 1, uh, so that if you let n go to infinity, then this term over here disappears, and it adds up to 1, right, so... Um, so uh, I, I will come back to, to an idea here uh, in, in a few uh, videos where, um, where you can see one way to apply this concept, but uh, the idea that you have this series that can uh, you know, take away half of the remaining amount of something with every wave, and then eventually it will perfectly resolve, right? If you allow it to carry on forever, it will resolve to... Uh, uh, to exactly whatever the whole number, whatever the whole one of whatever it was, is accounted for. Um, and so it, it's a way to approach one, you know, in this decaying fashion. Um, and so uh, I'll, you know, discuss that later. Uh, okay, so uh, it's time uh, to watch me you know, struggle my way through the code, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll all feel a little better about ourselves after... Um, after watching me flounder for a bit, or, you know, perhaps do a little bit better. We'll see. Uh, okay, so the first thing on our list was the heat. Um, oh, uh, yeah, what, what is a heat, right? Um, okay, so we finally reached our discussion on trees, so we can discuss heaps, right? Um, so uh, a heap is uh, it's a, a priority queue of sorts. Um, so uh, you have to have these you know, predefined actions uh, that you implement. Uh, and so there's uh, insert and there's uh, remove, and then uh, there's a a partial ordering uh, where every uh, every node is uh, has some relation to its parent. Right. So uh, if it's a uh, minimum priority queue, then it means that the parent has some less value in some sense uh, than uh, the 
or yeah, if it's a, a min heap, then it has some less value than each of its children, and that relationship holds. Uh, but you're not guaranteed, you know, uh, left that the left child is anything related to the right child. There's no guarantee there. Uh, the relationship is entirely defined uh, with the parent, uh, and then it's uh, balanced. Um, and so uh, the the height of the tree or of uh, every node is, um, or I guess the depth of the, the leaf nodes is all h or h minus one. So they're all within two levels. Uh, and so it grows like this. Uh, okay, and then uh, if I wanted to add another node, I would add it right here. And if I wanted to add again, here. Uh, and then if I wanted to add again, here. Uh, okay, and so this is just like the tree structure, but again, uh, a heap is uh, distinguished by that property, that heap property, or that priority queue property, that this node has precedence over each of these, and this node has precedence over each of these, and this node has precedence over each of these, right? So that parent to child relationship is always maintained. So uh, we'll say that we're dealing with a min heap, right? So that the next value that we pull out is is always the, the least element in the entire tree. Uh, and we'll see that the there's work to be done uh, to maintain uh, the heap property as, as we go along. So whenever we insert, uh, we need to make sure that you know that property is maintained. Um, and uh, whenever we remove, uh, we again need to make sure that the, the property is maintained, right? So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, I'll try to do it from memory. Uh, and uh, if I can't, well, then, you know, we'll uh, we'll look up how to do it. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it should be fine. I, I did it earlier this summer, so uh, we'll see. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, if I can't get it, you know, I'll be a little embarrassed, and, and y'all will feel uh, definitely better <laughs> about the progress that you're making because you're, you're learning how to code, right? Uh, but the important thing I want you to remember is that each one of these vertices uh, in in the tree uh, has some value associated with it, right? So. Uh, so let's get to coding and you know we'll work through the process there you'll see that there is you know struggle at any level for, for any developer um, but um, you know, you develop a bit of a, a process and uh, and you make your way through the problems uh, okay so we'll come back to this whenever we need to discuss what we're actually doing algorithmically to, to maintain uh, that heap and uh, we'll see if we're able to get through each of those three data structures and if not well uh, you know, we'll uh, move along. I'll, I'll briefly touch on, on what we'll do for the, the other ones and then, um, yeah, and we'll go from there. But uh, I, yeah, this is all about developing the process. So, uh, okay, so we have Rex Tester. This is just a, a plain project. Just to show that, we'll refresh it. Uh, I am a, a firm believer that we should always start with Hello World. Because uh, if you can't get to Hello World, then you're in real trouble. Uh, okay, so it works. So we're dealing with uh, a heap, yes, uh, but it's also a tree. Um, so we will go ahead and um, and create the luxury item of the the heap, right? Uh, and um, We'll do that because we need uh, to maintain a root, but the root isn't fixed, as is the case whenever you're constructing a, a tree from scratch or um, you know a, even a file system which represents a, a tree. You know the the roots are fixed; those aren't moving around. <laughs> you can't move a, a root to a, a child element or whatever. I can't really perform. Well, I guess you know, with enough work, you could swap out parent elements or, or children of the root, but you can't change the root. Um, but, you know, that is one of the intrinsic properties of, of the heap. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do the luxury item. 
Uh, okay, so the first thing we need for any tree or graph uh, is a node. Uh, so we'll create a class and we'll call it heap node. Uh, and as we're going along, uh, we will uh, add to it. Uh, so you never want to create more than you need to begin with. You, you want to make sure that uh, your code is slimmed down. Uh, and the way to do that is to only add something once you need it. Uh, and if you don't need it, don't include it for posterity's sake. Uh, the people going behind and, and maintaining uh, tend to give this, you know, uh, uh, deferential treatment to any code that already lives uh, because they have to go out of their way to prove that it's not being used but you as the developer the initial developer uh, should do your best to never check in any code that isn't being used um, because otherwise it tends to live on uh, and it rots <laughs> and so even if it's it's almost working or whatever like you spent a lot of time on it so you want to make sure that it's in and you'll finish it up later but you have to deal with some other feature or whatever well yeah don't don't ever do that right like that's <laughs> when I say you know get used to the idea of you know throwing away code that's part of it uh, you'll you'll have something that you almost finished um, but if it's not being used don't check it in you know delete it let it go away um, there's this, uh, you know, we, we spend a, a lot of time, you know, uh, building something up and, uh, you know, it, it feels like because we spent a lot of time that if we have to do it again, it's also going to take a lot of time, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, as we're working through these problems, uh, we gain some deeper understanding of how it is that it needs to be approached. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, sorry, we've barely gotten into this, right? But, and, and I'm already going on a tangent. But the, the first uh, major project that uh, I completed was um, this performance uh, project where uh, I was measuring the, the time that it took for certain functions to complete and then reporting that out. And so we could analyze our, our products to see where it was that we were spending all of our time uh, in whenever we had to, you know, create a, a new page and uh, you know what what exactly was it about our product that was so slow uh, and so um, you know I, I spent a lot of time you know coming up with the solution for it and then I finally got it in uh, and it took me I want to say it took about three months uh, in order you know from start to finish for me to develop it and implement it and you know test it all out uh, and then I left that job shortly after and the first thing I did was recreate that work in my new environment so I went through and I, I added all of these performance timers and uh, and then I you know reported that data out uh, and the work took me it, it was less than a week I want to say it was like three days or something like that so I went from three months down to three days uh, and you know that's the benefit of having done the work is that you know once you've you've solved something it it buries itself in your mind like you remember that because of the amount of work you invested uh, and so it can be difficult to let go of of that work um, but it's not actually difficult to recreate those solutions later on like you have earned that knowledge you know, uh, achievement unlocked right uh, and so um, so what I'm getting at is if you're ever presented with the chance to check in code that almost works because you spent a lot of time on it, don't. You know, it, if it comes up again, it will not take you the same amount of effort to do it the second time as it did the first time, and it won't take you the same amount of t effort the third time as it did the second time. Right? There is this uh, <laughs> this uh, decaying amount of effort necessary. It, it takes about half or less of the effort each successive time. So. Um, you know, uh, well, to a limit. <laughs> if there, it, it reaches a point where, uh, okay, it's second hand and, and you're just limited by, uh, or second nature and it's just limited by how quickly you can type. So, uh, okay. Uh, all right, so we have our heap node. Uh, nodes um, in a binary tree will have um, some, uh, they'll have children we are probably going to want a parent, but I feel bad about going back on uh, what I said about not putting anything in until you actually need it. 
Uh, so we're just going to go with the left and right child for now. Uh, so left, uh, left child. Uh, and we're going to define getters and setters, and C sharp has these convenience methods. Uh, and in fact, we can actually initialize it to null as well, so we don't need a constructor. Uh, and then uh, I also believe in always providing a, a two string function whenever you have an object. Uh, and it's just, uh, it doesn't take a lot of time to do it in the flow, like as you're developing the methods. Uh, uh, but the benefit as you're troubleshooting is uh, pretty significant. Um, and also, it does take a long time to have to go back and do it later. So it's, it's best to do it uh, as you're working. Uh, and then again, I said that I was a fan of interpolated strings. So you know, here we go. Uh, okay, so um, the left child will have a two string, but we won't be able to call it if it's null. Uh, so we need to check if it's null. And if it is, then just print null. And if it's not, uh, then call the two string method on it. And then we do the same test for the right child. Uh, okay. Uh, and then we forgot that the, the node ID, or the node, uh, is going to be identified by a value. Uh, so we'll just use integers for now. Uh, but this, uh, you know, we could define this uh, as some generic type, right? Uh, right, uh, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going to use integers. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay, so then we print out our value. Uh, and then our left and right children. Uh, okay. Uh, but really, you know, I, I want more than a comma separator, so I'm going to want um, carriage returns here. Okay. Uh, and then also, um, you know, uh, really more than, you know, this, I, uh, I want to maintain um, tabs uh, so that whenever it prints out, I'm not looking at value x left child and then value y and then left child and so forth, right? Like really what I want is for this to tab its way over each time. Uh, so what I can do is create a, a private method that returns a string. Um, um, and we'll just uh, say stringify child. And it maintains a depth so that uh, each level we go down in the tree, these children get tabbed over you know, e each time. Right? Um, so now, uh, because I'm still in this class, uh, I can call stringify child instead, okay. uh, and we'll initialize it with a depth of one. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and so this will basically do the same thing uh, as this. Right? Uh, okay. And we increase the depth each time. Depth plus one. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we need to generate the tabs. Uh, so um, we'll say that uh, var t uh, our tabs uh, here we'll use a string builder. Uh, and so a, a string builder is a utility uh, that defers uh, creating a string uh, which if you're doing it in a loop, it, it can be somewhat costly. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the framework is pretty efficient at creating strings, but if you're creating thousands of them and then discarding them, it creates this huge memory footprint and then it leaves them there. And strings are, uh, even though they have the plus operator, or whatever, they're non-mutable and that's for security reasons that so you don't get the buffer overflow issues. Uh, that you have with C, and if we have time, maybe we'll talk about how that affects security and how you can uh, kind of hack a, a program that was developed in C. Uh, and you know, it you can't in Java and C sharp. Um, anyway, um, but we're we're going to use the string builder, uh, and it's just a a utility for whenever you're constructing a string uh, inside of a loop. Uh, so while depth is greater than zero, uh, then uh, we will append to our string builder object a tab. Uh, and so now we have sb.toString. Uh, well, actually, because we want to use it everywhere that we have a line break, we want to use our tabs. So let's create a tabs variable. So we have our carriage return and then tabs and so forth. All right, that's good. Um, okay, uh, but really, I want to lead with a carriage return. I think we'll see. Uh, and so now we have this, and this is basically doing the same thing as this. So really, all I need to do at this point uh, is return a stringify child. Uh, and I'll pass in zero as an initial value. Uh, and then its children will have a depth of one and so forth. And it'll construct it for me. And it'll do it with zero tabs, which is perfect. Um, but now, since I'm using it on this method, does it make sense to call it stringify? Uh, so let's say, let's call it stringify node. Right. Now it makes a little more sense. OK, we know what we're doing. Uh, and we should probably, uh, one, make sure that it still compiles. Oh, well, hold on. Uh, so first, we have to satisfy the other one. We forgot a library. So system.txt. Okay. Got rid of one of the errors. Um, did I misspell? No. Turns a string, okay. 
Um, Twenty and twenty one. Oh, okay, so we didn't rename it here. Uh, okay, so it compiles. Uh, we're no worse the wear for our struggles. Uh, okay, uh, so let's uh, go ahead and construct. Uh, a modest tree here. So we'll have a root. Uh, and still compiles, everything's still accessible. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. It's really thinking about it. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're able to construct that. We are using the default constructor because we haven't defined one. Um, but C sharp has an initializer syntax. So uh, if you have something where the main purpose of the class is to just hold data uh, and it's not going out of its way to protect the data, uh, really its purpose is to act a, a lot like a JSON object or a, a JavaScript object uh, where it's, um, you know, really you just needed a place to stick all of this data that's related to each other. Um, but uh, you don't want some, you know, some magnificent class structure or whatever. It's, uh, the term for that in C-sharp is a, a POCO object or a plain old CLR object. Um, and uh, anyway, so we can use the initializer syntax and we don't have to construct a, uh, uh, a constructor to receive all of this data. Uh, so uh, we'll use it to initialize the value uh, and we'll say that the root node has a value of zero, sure. Um, or, well, let's give it, um, we'll give it a value of 1. Uh, okay, uh, and so the left one, I don't feel like extending it to multiple lines, uh, we'll give it a value of 2. And the right one, a value of 3. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, uh, what I want is I would like to print this out. Um, so let me print my nodes individually, and the two string is called implicitly. If it's provided, uh, it'll use your overrided two string, and if not, it'll call two string, and I'll just indicate that it's an object. Oh man, it really does not like this initializer syntax. Uh, okay, so I don't know what version of the CLR it is. Uh, 2.9 was not a version. Um, so it likes this, and this came along in 4. <laughs> so uh, it should allow us the initializer syntax. Uh, but let's see if that's what it's complaining about. So everything has a default value. Uh, so we don't, strictly speaking, we don't need to initialize it just yet. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I have no idea what compiler they're using, but that's fine. We'll work with it. We'll work with it. Don't give up. Uh, okay, so then uh, we need to specify the value. We said this was going to be a 1. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's printing. It looks just fine. Uh, let's uh, turn our uh, unaffiliated nodes uh, into um, a tree structure. Uh, so uh, root dot left left child equals left root dot right child equals 
right. And we gotta we'll give it a second thing. Uh, okay. Uh, so it says that we exceeded our given resources. Um, so that's going to be a peculiarity of Rex Tester. Child, right child. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, let's see. Um, Uh, okay, so yeah, we create a folder uh, and then we run .NET new console and it creates it for us. Uh, so let's see if we can use that. Um, <laughs> we'll see. This could be a total disaster. Uh, if this if this tanks, I'm not the one to ask for your money back. <laughs> it's uh, just so you know. Um, okay, so uh, hold on. Let me figure out where this is going to live. Um, Okay, so I have this heap directory now. Okay. Um, so the first thing I, I want to do is create the project as prescribed here. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so you remember what I said about infinite loops. Um, so what we need to be using is a decrementer here. Yeah, so uh, you haven't lived until you've created your first infinite loop. Um, so, uh, bully on us. Uh, okay, great. So now we have it that it's working. Uh, and... Uh, and it seems to be printing out. Let's add a grandchild just to see. There, left, left.
this out anymore. Oh. Uh, great, so it you see the clear order of descendants here. Perfect. Um, and so uh, I think one of the things that's really cool here is you can kind of already see this trend that um, the right child has an odd value. So if we if we begin our count by one, uh, then we see that the left child is twice the value of the parent, and the uh, and its left child again is twice the value of the parent. Uh, and then the right child will be uh, one more than its sibling, right? Uh, so uh, so that'll come back uh, because uh, shift left operations, right? Because we're using a, a binary representation uh, is akin to uh, multiplying by 2. Um, so we can define uh, this relationship between parent and child where the parent is equal to the child's, uh, well if we were to call this an ID, a node ID uh, instead of a, a value, uh, where the parent is half or shift right the value of the child. Right? Um, so uh, that's we're kind of manipulating the, the binary representation there. So we'll come back to that. Uh, okay. Um, so we have a, at least something to keep our program honest so we can see what's what we're actually creating. Um, so we have a node and we can use it to construct a, a tree relationship, but we don't actually have uh, a heap yet. Uh, so let's uh, create that. Uh, okay, uh, so it's going to need some internal representation of the heap. Uh, and this is something that we're going to want to keep private. Um, we want to expose the heap through methods, uh, but we don't actually want anything to manipulate it directly. That's um, The heap has these properties that must be maintained, and uh, because we're using object-oriented programming, the, the heap knows how to maintain its own like those those promises, the the guarantee that the parent has some value in relation to the child, um, the heap knows how to do that, and nothing else really does. And so that's when you distinguish between the accessors. So here, um, you know, uh, the the left child and right child. We could say that anything that knows about the nodes, you know, it has some awareness and and can manipulate that relationship. And in particular, we haven't provided anything uh, in the class that will actually uh, handle those relationships. So those are exposed to the world. And the same thing with value. Uh, so really, it's just a, a storage utility, uh, this type of class. But this, uh, which has a, a little more logic to it and uh, purports to promise some structure, uh, that will have to uh, to guard it, to encapsulate that data in order to provide that guarantee. Uh, so this is when we distinguish between public variables or uh, public uh, properties of a class uh, and private properties. Okay. Uh, so the internal representation of the heap uh, is just going to be um, we'll we'll just use a list. Um, so we have our generic here. Uh, so we'll have a private list, and the list will be composed of heap nodes. Uh, and uh, we'll just call that heap. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, we have a, our class now. Um, but we're not really doing anything with it. Um, okay. So uh, we need to provide uh, a few methods. Um, so we'll need to provide insert, and I think that's void. 
Uh, so uh, insert node, uh, and that will accept one of our heap nodes. And it'll do a thing, uh, but for now, since uh, we haven't defined it, we'll just throw an exception. There's a note to self that <laughs> something has not been implemented. Uh, does that compile? It does. Okay, excellent. Uh, and then uh, we need a way to extract. Uh, and so this will return a node. Uh, no, and uh, and the structure of the heap, right? That uh, we're using it as a, a minimum queue, a, a min min heap, uh, so that whatever sits on top is guaranteed to be the least item in that heap, right? So in this case, it has the value, the least value. Um, so. So that'll return it. Uh, and for now, we can just throw a non-implemented exception there as well. Right, and let's make sure. Oh. Uh, okay. So now uh, let's talk about how we're going to pull this trick off. Um, so we return to our whiteboard and we, we brainstorm a little bit. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we have these values, right, for now. Uh, so we have that this is twice of this this is twice of this, and this is this plus one. Right, so uh, right now we're calling them value. Uh, in a little bit, we're gonna change that to node ID. And we're gonna show that uh, you can, given a, a node ID, like, and, and this is, I think this is another luxury item. It's not exactly required by the heap structure, but um, it'll allow you to jump around. Uh, so uh, you could do this with an array and in JavaScript, you could use an array because it's a uh, dynamic enough structure in C Sharp and Java and C and C++. Uh, the array uh, is uh, in Go as well. Uh, the type of the array is actually determined by the size of it. Like it, uh, you can't add objects or, or push objects onto it the way that you can a JavaScript array. So you have to declare it. Uh, and in each of those languages, they, there's a means by which you can, uh, at runtime, determine the size of the array. But whenever you actually allocate the memory for it, it has to be fixed. Uh, but C Sharp does provide something that is like an array, uh, and that's the, the list structure uh, that we're going to use. Uh, and in fact, it actually has a, a sorted list, which is, uh, I would imagine they're using uh, a... Uh, priority key uh, queue underneath uh, so there is a, a built-in type that does this uh, but again like it's uh, and we're kind of just exercising our minds and uh, working through these problems so that we can draw on the experience later on and, and use it to um, uh, to maybe attack other problems that you know we, we wouldn't necessarily come up with a, a ready-made solution to begin with but um, yeah, so uh, even though there is built-in structures that you can use to represent this stuff, um, it's still uh, to your benefit to to learn how to address these problems in kind of an abstract way. Uh, okay, so uh, let's say that this wasn't the case, right? So um, uh, okay, so what we need uh, is a way. Uh, to maintain balance first, right? So the first thing we have to agree is how are we going to support these new operations, so insert and extract, 
uh, and maintain that balance. Um, so we'll say that this has value A, uh, and then when we insert, we insert in the next available slot, remember, and so it's it goes level by level, so down and then left to right. So down and then left to right. Down and then left to right. So that's how we insert. Uh, okay. Uh, and so um, it is, you know, this, <laughs> it is a structure that is recursively maintained. So you're given something that can call itself a heap as input. And then you're attaching, or and then you need to create some new structure that still calls itself a heap. Uh, and so uh, there's the property of balance that has to be maintained uh, so that uh, if you don't have a full tree, that it maintains this down and then left to right structure. Right? That's how it's, it's uh, continued. Right? Um, so the first thing, whenever we're inserting, is that we will insert in the next available slot, right? So here, B was the next available slot. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, well, actually let's say that we already have these two. And so we add some element C. Okay. But we don't know, so, okay, so we've satisfied balance, but now we need to satisfy uh, the priority, right? So this, uh, for a min Q, or min heap, uh, this needs to be less than this. So the, the ordering with respect to the, the lineage, the ancestry, has to be maintained. So this is our new node. We already know that it was satisfied for this. And we know that since it's a heap, that A, since it's a min heap, that A is less than B. So uh, by the transitive property, right, if If C is less than A, which was already defined to be less than B by that transitive property, then C is less than B. Right? So we really only need to test going up, right? We've inserted here. Uh, and so if C is less than A uh, and we make that swap, well, then it's already guaranteed to be less than B and we're done. Right? Uh, so we make the comparison. A comes before C in the alphabet, so it's satisfied. Um, so uh, what happens though if uh, if that's not the case? Uh, okay, so the the Greek Empire came before the Roman Empire, right? Before we got our, our Latin character set, we have our Greeks. So let's say that Alpha comes before A. Right? So now we have uh, that Alpha is less than A. So we've made our insertion, and now we need the ability to uh, to trickle up, essentially. To uh, you can call it bubble up, you can call it trickle up, you can call it sift up. Uh, I think sift is actually the term that's used. Uh, so we make the comparison. So this was the insertion. We make our comparison with the parent. And so then we make that swap. Uh, and we continue to sift up. So this was the new node. Uh, and so now um, it's not settled. We haven't guaranteed that the structure that we're returning is again a heap after following our insertion until this stops sifting up. Uh, but we're relying on the, the total ordering of this uh, relationship, the fact that you could compare directly any two elements if you wanted. Uh, and so you continue to compare this new node with its parent until it either reaches the root and becomes the least element in your heap uh, or um, uh, or it has a parent that 
has a uh, higher priority than it, and so then it stops uh, trickling up or sifting up. All right. Uh, okay, so that's insertion. Um, and so uh, what do we do about extraction? Uh, how do we satisfy that? Uh, okay, so the way extraction is handled is, again, first we satisfy the balance, and then we figure out some clever way of satisfying the priority. So in each case, balance and then priority. So here that was uh, the next avail inserting into the next available slot and then sifting up. And you can guess that now uh, we're actually taking away from the last uh, slot used and then sifting down. Right. So if we wanted to extract a node, we would I think you can see that. Okay, good. Yeah. So we would uh, remove from the top, right? So our, our structure guaranteed that we could find the the next item in our priority queue, or the next item in our min heap, uh, right there at the top. Uh, and then we go to the last node, and we make that the root, the new root after an extraction. Um, so we have balance, but we don't have priority yet. So now we need to take this and we need to sift down. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, we compare left and then uh, right uh, for for balance reasons, right? So we're we're going level by level and then left to right. So whenever we're sifting down, we first test left and then we test right, uh, just to make sure that we don't end up with gaps in our tree, right? So testing left, we see that the child has higher priority than the, the new parent. So this one comes up here. Oh, actually, uh, sorry, um, we test uh, to see, uh, we have to test it against both children, right, and uh, we have to test the two children together, right. Uh, so, um, so first we have to test left against right, so So if neither of them is null, um, then uh, so you, you throw out the nulls, right? Uh, and then you take the minimum of them. Uh, and so that becomes the new parent. Otherwise, you end up having to backtrack and make multiple swaps or whatever. So you just want to deal with whichever one is the min element, throwing away the nulls. Um, so, uh, so it's this one. It turns out that you need to swap. So then. They swap, two gets put at the root. We've already guaranteed that it's the minimum element because we took the, the next two challengers, the next two in line for the throne, uh, and we had already compared them here before we tried, before we tested to see whether or not we needed to swap. Uh, and whenever we did need to swap, we were guaranteed that we were dealing with the minimum. Right. So again, we need to call sift down until it fully shakes out until it either has two null children uh, or it has priority over all of its children. So again, we test min left and right with four and five. And four is the min element. And again, six is not less than four, so we need to swap. Uh, okay, and now it has two null children and, and we can stop doing it. Right? Uh, so, uh, 
So, we can see now that we've worked it out that we can maintain a heap through this recursive uh, guarantee uh, by providing two external methods, insert and extract, and two private methods, sift up to be used by insert, and sift down to be used by extract. And that's sufficient to guarantee balance uh, and priority. Uh, and <laughs> unfortunately, we won't have time to, to do that. Uh, so um, I'm not sure what exactly that I'm going to do about um, providing this code to you. We, uh, we were only able to go over heap. Uh, we haven't discussed AVL trees yet. We haven't discussed graphs. Uh, I, I had a, a pretty cool example for a way to use a graph. So you start off with this parent graph and then you uh, start uh, breaking vertices um, based on certain conditions. And, and uh, essentially there's a way to, um, to optimize um, representing celestial bodies, right? So uh, whenever you're dealing with gravity, you know, you, uh, you have this graph where everything is essentially related to everything else uh, because uh, it's a sum of forces. So you, you compute the gravitational draw of one body uh, on, on every other body and, uh, and then you add up those forces, the net forces, and then you iterate forward in time. Uh, but it's it's fairly costly because it's a uh, it's an adjacency matrix, right? So uh, so every node is in a sense uh, is in essence uh, connected to every other node. It's adjacent to every other node. Um, but uh, you know, from common sense, we know that planets uh, have this uh, you know greater effect on on the other stuff in the system, uh, planets and stars, than than the lighter stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, one way to do that, one way to, to take, you know, all of the known bodies and then trim it to uh, a reasonable amount of arithmetic uh, is to uh, reduce to, to regions of influence, right? So the moons of Jupiter are not going to, like, it, it's in a, it's, their effect on, say, the Earth or the Earth or uh, our moon or, uh, anywhere else in, in our solar system uh, is going to converge to a point mass essentially centered at Jupiter uh, so that um, anything that's within Jupiter's that orbits around Jupiter uh, whenever you're dealing with something that's in Jupiter's system then you could leave them there they, they relate to Jupiter but whenever you're dealing with anything that's outside of Jupiter's system then uh, the nodes of the graph, you know, those those go away for all of those smaller bodies, and you deal at a system level with that, right? And so, um, so it's uh, a familiar example uh, of something that you could use a, a graph representation for. Uh, and so it's you know computing gravitational effects, and uh, uh, and so it's um, it, it's a way to see how you can use graphs to you know uh, to optimize certain problems. Uh, and so maybe we'll discuss that later. We still have a, a few coding classes to discuss. Uh, there are other topics that I'm, I'm uh, you know, jumping at the chance to discuss with you. Um, you got to see uh, what a terrible coder I am <laughs> in the moment. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's fine. You know, uh, becoming uh, you know fluent in uh, as a programmer isn't about uh, eliminating the mistakes. It's about uh, knowing how to deal with them once you encounter them and uh, really just getting to the point that uh, or getting past the point where you throw your hands up in the air and be like ah, I'm done with this I'm, I'm never you know writing another line of code or whatever so once you get past that uh, you know it's it, it's essentially all the same we all make tons of mistakes every day uh, and the better you are you know not necessarily the fewer mistakes you make you you will make fewer mistakes but uh, the less time it takes between uh, whenever you get the the negative feedback from the compiler or whatever uh, and uh, whenever you um, you get back at, at uh, hacking out the next solution or, or the fix to the problem, whatever. So it's it's about uh, reducing the time in between. Um, so uh, okay, uh, so I'll figure out what I'm going to code for you next, and and uh, I'll see you after the weekend. So uh, have a good weekend, everyone.